practical that you're going to get on with. Um, it's called fractals, and um, as you might have guessed, we're going to be generating fractals. And this practical draws on um, the earlier lecture um, that I gave about task finds and random balance. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to generate the Mandelbrot set. Okay, what is the Mandelbrot set? Now, I'm going to go into a little bit of math, but the details aren't really that important. Basically, the idea is, is that you have a complex number. Um, so a complex number has a, a real part, say x, and an imaginary part, say y. So we can think of this like the x and y coordinates on a, a 2D plane. And what you're doing is you're basically taking this complex function, zn equals zn minus 1 squared plus b and you're iterating and what you're doing is you're starting with some initial condition z0 equals 0 say for example and you're just going to put that into the formula and keep iterating for some particular value of c and you iterate and iterate and iterate and iterate and what you're doing is that you want to see if the series of numbers that you generate from this complex function um, converges or if it diverges um, I should say if it does not diverge if it doesn't diverge then it belongs to the Mandelbrot set um, and if it does diverge it doesn't um, so like I said, the, the details aren't so important, but just in case, um, when you look at the code, if you have a look at the code, you might be wondering what it's doing. You can see that to work out the, uh, the square of a complex number, we've got this formula, and we're just basically squaring the real part and squaring the imaginary part. So what, what the code does, what the factor code does, is just... Um, okay, sorry, going into a bit more detail, um, we can separate your complex number into the real part, into the imaginary part, and work through all this. And basically what we're doing is we're saying, okay, I take a point in the complex plane and I go through this formula and I iterate and I iterate and I iterate. And I want to see if it will uh, converge and diverge. Now you can carry on, of course, iterating for as long as you like. Um, how do you know that you've diverged or converged? Well, basically what we do is we set a threshold. And we say that if the series of numbers that we generate cross that threshold, then we're going to assume that, that that particular point in the complex plane gives a series of numbers that will eventually diverge. If, however, after a set number of maximum iterations, so say n max, we say we're only going to do n max iterations, and if after that, after we've done n max iterations, if those uh, numbers don't cross that threshold, or z squared doesn't cross that threshold, which here we've set to 4, then that means we're going to assume that that series converges, and therefore that point belongs to the Mandelbrot set. Okay, and here we have a lovely picture, and you'll be generating the of the Mandelbrot set here. And these points here, the dark black one, well, the black ones, <laughs> are all that are in the Mandelbrot set, and all these coloured ones are on the outside. And of course, we have this lovely fractal boundary here. Okay. Um, in the fractal practical, you can actually also calculate the Julia set. So just briefly, I mean, we want you to focus on the Mandelbrot set, but you can of course do this for the Julia set. The Julia set, Julia set is also similar, it's similar to the Mandelbrot set, but where our formula here for the Mandelbrot set, we, we take this complex C constant, and that's the thing that we change. So if this is our complex plane, and we pick a point, we take the x value and the y value, and that's our C complex uh, number, which we put into this formula and we vary it. And we fix the initial value z0 to be 0, and it's 0 for whichever point we take and work out the series for. With the Julia set, we do it the other way around. We say that actually for each constant C complex number, you can get an infinite number of Julia sets. You can parameterize an, uh, can, an infinite number of Julia sets can be parameterized by the complex number C. So we fix C to be some complex number. For example, here, I think this is just taken from the Wikipedia article about Julia sets. Um, but what we do is we vary the initial value. So as we move along the complex plane, we just pick a point and we vary it, and that's our initial z value that we put in the function. So as you can say, they're kind of flip sides of the same coin. And I think this value actually generates this Julia set. It's quite nice. Okay, so that's the details of working out whether a point or not is in the Mandelbrot set. How do we visualize this? Well, we fix a value n max, which is your maximum number of iterations. And what we say is, okay, so our complex number is represented as a point on the 2D grid. So, like I said, the x value is your real part of the complex number and your y value is the imaginary part. And we pick a point and we just go through that formula, iterate through, iterate, 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 until one of two things happens. 
either the values exceed that threshold or we reach n max. Now, if it um, exceeds the threshold, we note at what value, what, well, how many iterations did it take to cross that threshold, i.e., how many iterations before we can assume it's going to diverge. And uh, if it doesn't, then uh, we set, obviously, the, the maximum number of iterations have been reached, and therefore we just take that value, however many iterations, n or n max, and we convert it to a color, and then we use that to plot on our grid. So that's how you get these lovely diagrams. Um, now, of course, we're going to be splitting this across processes. So we're going to break up our complex plane, our 2D grid, and we're going to give a process a chunk of that, one of our parallel tasks. And if you think about it, these colored points are the points where you haven't reached n max. I, these are the points where the series diverges. They don't belong to the Mandelbrot set. So the values for n are very low. Um, and so you can imagine that if there's a process of working on this region, it will get through all the points pretty quickly because it will quickly find that each series crosses the threshold and then it can stop at, at whatever value of n it's at. Um, whereas the processes that have to deal with this part of the grid, i.e. The, the dealing with the points that actually belong in the Mandelbrot set, you can imagine each point is going to, you're going to carry on iterating, iterating, iterating until you hit n max, which is going to take a while because n max is going to be large, and then it can move on to the next point. So the processes doing work here will have to work pretty hard, whereas the ones working here um, have got it easy. So thinking about what we were talking about earlier about task farms and load imbalance, that's really what we want you to investigate with this practical. So in terms of the parallelization, uh, in terms of the parallelization, as I said, we're going to do a grid decomposition, and we're going to break up our plane into equal size blocks, so equal number of um, equal size parallel tasks, and uh, Crucially, there's no communication needed between the blocks. Now, if you remember, when I was talking about task farms, I said that really task farms are really good for uh, problems where you can uh, divide your problem so that the parallel tasks have basically zero communication. You don't need the processes to talk to each other, and that's what we have here. Um, uh, you don't know in advance how much work each process is going to do. I mean, okay. We know that that's our end result, but in advance, you don't know. You don't know which process is going to have to um, is going to have lots of points that belong in the Mandelbrot set or not. So beforehand, we don't know how well um, our problem is going to be load balanced, um, and this is something you're going to investigate. You're going to see how you changing the size of your tasks, changing the size of the the grid, the granularity of the grid um, will affect how well the code performs and how well the, the work or the load um, across your processes is balanced. So in the, in the, in the practical, you'll see that, uh, in the code, you'll see that what happens is the work is dynamically assigned to worker. So as a worker finishes and sends the results back to the master, the master says, OK, I still have some more stuff that needs worked out. So here, and it will give the worker a new task. And it just does that dynamically. It doesn't know beforehand, right at the beginning, which task is going to get given to which worker or how many tasks. Uh, so the implementation, yeah, like I said, we split the grid into blocks. Each block is a task. We've got a master processor that handles all the work workers, and yeah, as in the task farm, uh, the workers just return the completed results to the master, and then at the end, the master puts everything together, and you get your lovely diagram. So this is just um, okay. This is just an example parallelization. So we've got four processors. We've got uh, one that's the master and the uh, three workers. And you can imagine you start up here in the left hand corner. So uh, the master process gives worker one this block, gives worker two that block, gives worker three this block. Um, and uh, sorry, my mistake. So actually, sorry. <laughs> so the colors, the colors represent the processes. Uh, so we've got uh, process one, um, worker one. Uh, takes care of block one, takes care of block five, takes care of block eight. Processor two takes care of block two, four, nine, and processor three, three, six, seven. Okay, sorry, yeah, the colors represent the workers. Um, and you're just moving from left to right, so that's your origin, x, y, and you're scanning upwards. So that's just a, an example of what it will look like. This is an actual run. So this is results from an actual run. 
Um, and what you have here is you've got your picture, of course, your Mandelbrot set, and overlay um, is how we've divided up the grid. And also the numbers represent the uh, workers that were taking care of those regions. So if we look here, um, yes, so if we look here, um, it's shaded as well, sorry. So the, the darker it is, the shading represents the processes as well. Um, so okay, so what happens? We give worker one this block, we give worker two this block, we give worker three this block. Now if you notice, these are all the, as I said, these are all the um, easy points because they're not in a Mandelbrot set. But if you look over here, we start to get a bit of the Mandelbrot set. So we would imagine that worker three, worker one and two would finish pretty quickly and worker three might get stuck for a little while. And then we've got worker four. Um, so worker one is finished, so it gets given a task, but worker one also has a little bit of the Mandelbrot set here. Worker four finishes pretty quickly, um, and it gets given this. Now, you, of course, it has a lot of work to do because it's got a lot, uh, quite a chunk of the manual box set there. But here you can see that worker two and worker one. Okay, so worker two, worker one finishes. Worker three is obviously taking its time working out these um, values here. So worker two gets assigned this block. Worker one comes back and gets that block, and so on. And then we get worker three again. It gets a little chunk. Worker three finishes, and Worker three gets this block, it finishes here pretty quickly. And what we expect around here is that we expect processor one and processor two, worker one, worker two, taking quite a bit of time because they've got a large um, chunk of the Mandelbrot set. So they've got a lot of work to do. So while they're working and the other guys are finishing, they're getting all the other tasks. And that's what you see here. You see that worker one and worker two are basically not free to finish off um, the rest of the calculation, but worker three and worker four are, and they get assigned the rest of the tasks. Okay? So that's how we expect things to work. And um, okay, so in your exercise, you're given the code. Uh, you don't need to understand the details of code. We've gone over the most important algorithm and how it's parallelized and how you're going to visualize it. Um, you, can, you should be able to just compile and run the code on Archer, visualize the results. And um, in your handouts, you will see that there are some questions that ask you to um, look at the loading balance factor and look at look at how. Um, how well your code is performing and if you can improve it. So if you remember from the lecture, the loading balance factor is the maximum load divided by the average load, right? And you will get this information out in your output about what the maximum load is, what the average load is. And what you will see initially is that your, your LIF, your loading balance factor, is going to be quite high. It might be something like, I don't know, five or something like that. And that should then tell you that what, given the runtime that you have for that particular run, you can then say, okay, well, if my... Clearly my, um, clearly my configuration at the moment is poorly uh, balanced. I need to improve the load balance. So what the loading balance factor tells you, if it's, say, if it's five, is that you can improve your runtime by up to five times. And so what you want to try and do is reduce the size of your chunks um, and see how you can improve um, the load balance. And, and if you keep making those tasks smaller and smaller and smaller, see if you're always going to get really good runtime in the end, if you get the predicted runtime, the best ideal runtime, or if it's a case that actually, if you make your tasks too small, the overhead is too large, and then actually your runtime starts to increase again. Okay? So I'm just going to go over some of the outcomes that you should have seen, got results that you should have got, and uh, why perhaps we were getting those results. Okay, so this is just an example of some of the results. Uh, here we've got a table here of number of tasks, and in brackets, the task size, and the execution time for the factory program, and the load and balance factor that you will have seen printed out every time you've got the results. Um, so the maximum number of iterations here was fixed at 5,000, and of course we fixed the number of workers. I know some of you thought that you had to vary the number of workers, but of course that's not what the task was about. It was about spreading the load across the uh, number of workers, fixed number of workers evenly. So if we look at this table, we can see very clearly that for the default setup, where you've got 16 tasks of size 192 by 192 pixels, uh, the runtime is, of course, the largest. It's around two seconds. And we get a loading balance factor of 5. Now, the point of the loading balance factor, and the reason we were, I was going on about it and, and, and talking about it, was that we can use the loading balance factor to predict what our best runtime will be if our program was balanced perfectly. So the way to do that, or the way to think about that perhaps, is if you remember, the load and balance factor is defined as the maximum load divided by the average load. So the maximum load, 
uh, whichever worker has the maximum load or whichever number of workers have the maximum load, they will of course take the longest amount of time. So the, if, if all the workers have the average load, of course, they will all be taking the same amount of time and that's going to be our best run time. So we use the loading balance factor by saying, okay, here we can see that it's five and our run time is about two seconds. So we know we can use the loading balance factor by saying, well, okay, the ideal loading balance factor, LIF, is just one. Okay, that's when everything is evenly distributed. So how do we get one from the loading balance factor? Well, of course, we just divide by five. So we know that actually we should, our best run time should be five times faster than uh, the run time that we get for this setup. So if we divide 1.93 by 5, of course we get about 0.4. And as we see, as we decrease um, the size of our parallel tasks and we increase the number of tasks, we see that actually, yes, the run time is decreasing, which is what we want. And alongside that, the loading balance factor is, of course, decreasing as well, which again is what we want. And we get our predicted best run time, okay? 0.4, which is great. Now you can think, okay, well, that's fabulous. I can carry on indefinitely... Um, decreasing the task size and increasing the number of tasks. But actually, as you see, the run time starts increasing again. And this is not great. So this is a graph that just plots those results. So the blue line here is the execution time, the actual run time. And the red line is our predicted uh, 0.4 seconds. Now we can understand why we have this, um, or if you like, why we have tail offs, opposite tail offs at either end of the graph. So of course, for a small number of tasks where the size of each task is very large, of course, we just don't have enough. Um, we don't have enough tasks per worker. So we've only got one task. In the beginning, we've only got one task per worker. So uh, if there is a, a task, of course, that doesn't involve much computation, that worker is going to finish quickly, and then it's going to have nothing else to do. So it's going to be idle. So we can understand why we have um, load imbalance and we have such a large runtime for a small number of tasks. At the other end of the scale, why are we getting an increase in the run time? Well, if you think about it, at that end of the scale, each task ends up being one pixel. So what you're doing is the master process is giving each worker one pixel. And of course, one pixel, that's not a lot. Even if it's a, a point within a nanobot set, that's not going to take any worker very much time. So that worker is going to finish really quickly, and it's going to say to the master, hey, I want some more work. But actually, the master is still dishing out loads of pixels to the workers. Um, and so there will be workers waiting for the master to come back and give it something to do. And so again, we're back to the point, we're back to the situation where we've got load imbalance again, and we've got an increase in runtime. So that end of the graph where you've got, uh, where the task size is too small, if you remember the, when we were looking at grid decomposition, we were looking at granularity. At that end of the scale, when if you make your task sizes too small, you start to feel the effects of um, paralleliz parallelization overheads. For example, in this case, communication between the master and the worker. Any questions so far? No? OK, so uh, the next two slides are just pictures that hopefully you will have recreated. Here we see uh, the default case where you've got 16 workers um, and 16 tasks. So each square, and it's nicely shaded. Um, we've got a gradient from darkest to lightest, represents a worker. Um, and of course, as I described earlier, we get a loading balance factor of 5. Um, and this should look pretty familiar from having done the practical. Picture looks different again, of course, if you increase the number of tasks. So we've got 64 tasks, and you can see that now we've got um, uh, much more variation. We've got some, so worker one, which is the, uh, sorry, worker four, which is the brightest here, um, has is doing a lot of work here because it's all easy. Let's just get given uh, loads of tasks. Um, and then we've got some of the darker square, so these are some workers that are doing, obviously, you can't see it because it's under the nanobot set, but they're doing all the hard work, so they get given fewer tasks. Okay. So just a few slides to cover the key points to take away. So this practical covered task farms, and you've got to see um, how a task farm works with a master worker pattern, where the tasks are independent, um, there's basically no communication between the workers, of course there's communication between the master and the worker. Um, you can have different types of tasks, i.e. you could have parallel tasks that require some communication between workers, but that just complicates things. Um, and it's the master's job to distribute the tasks. And it, for this um, practical, we had dynamical distributing. So the master didn't know beforehand 
how long the task was going to take. It was just like, it just had a set of tasks and it was just dissing them out as workers asked for more work. Um, as you would have done, you can improve your load balance by, of course, changing your task size, the number of tasks, um, but you can incur some overhead if you uh, make your task sizes too small and have too many tasks. Um, and yeah, and as we've seen, load balance can adversely affect performance. Question? Yeah. Uh, is a way to evaluate the, the, the difficult or to look at the minimum time that it was. This can be used for any kind of uh, method you are using from the actual or specific for some method. That means if I'm using surface of the K or all right, or these kind of stuff. If yeah, this, I mean, the load balance factor, so in a way, it's, 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 we're using it here because it's, for this example, which is a nice example, quite simple, you know, programs, quite simple problem, it's a nice uh, way to factor, it's a nice way to quantify this load balance. Of course, in a real problem, in a real problem, a real application, it's going to be a lot more complicated because uh, as the question was raised yesterday, how do you define a, a, a work? And uh, it becomes a lot more difficult. So really, this is just, this is really illustrative to give you an idea of, of oh, okay. the sorts of things to expect, yeah. So I, I wouldn't say that you could go away necessarily and try and find the load balance factor. I mean, you know, it depends on your problem, but most applications are probably too complicated and um, it will be tricky, yeah. But this is ma mainly to, to make you aware, to give you an idea of what's going on and how you how changing this, the size of your task, the granularity of your uh, decomposition, how it can affect, you know, and it's not just, so the point is that it's not just about scalability, okay? Yeah. It, you have to think about, um, what each processor is doing. You want each processor to be doing as much work as possible and all processors to be doing equal amount of work. Uh, so yeah, so just uh, going over tasks, uh, it's a unit of work, um, not necessarily easy to define in real applications. Um, and of course they can vary in size. <coughs> um, if you know how long a particular task, if you know how long your, uh, for your application you've timed it and you've got a well-defined um, uh, You've got a good definition for what, what, what work is, what your parallel task is, and you know roughly how long it will take if it's working on this size or that problem size or whatever. Then uh, you can, of course, predict beforehand um, how long it will take um, to run this set of parallel tasks on this worker and so on and so forth. And, and uh, that's a, a static pattern of trying to distribute um, your parallel task. But as in our fractal practical, the master worker was just, sorry, the master process was just dynamically working out um, who to send tasks to, and it didn't matter. So yeah, uh, just uh, holding the point again that the master generates a pool of tasks. So it's the master's job. It gets the it gets the whole problem. It divides it up, creates a, uh, a pool of tasks, and then just dis disses out the tasks to workers while they're idle. So load balancing is understanding how a system how uh, a system determines how works or tasks are distributed across workers. So that's what load balance is. And we you know load balance gets talked about a lot when you're talking about parallel programming, when you're talking about applications, it's, a, it's an important thing. Um, and yeah, you will come across it a lot <laughs> in HPC. Um, and it's one of the performance metrics that really you need to consider when you're looking at how well your parallelization is doing. So yeah, just reiterating the point that if you have good load balancing, you might not have perfect load balancing, of course, but if you have good load balancing, you know, you minimize the number of idle processes um, and you make sure as many of your calls are busy as much of the time as possible. And yeah, poor load balancing leads to underutilized calls. Obvious point. And finally, perhaps something that we don't tend to think about as uh, programmers or software developers, we let other people worry about it, um, is the cost of your program. Um, so that's increasingly, of course, becoming important, um, especially as we're utilizing more and more calls for our programs. Um, so <coughs> you may say, okay, my program runs on uh, uh, you know, I want it to go faster, I, I want to use um, more cores, let's run it on 4,000 um, processors, this will be great. Um, but actually, if your program is not utilizing each core effectively, and if you've got poor load balance, then this is a really poor use of those 4,000 cores, and it's going to be expensive. So you might actually think, well, actually, rather than trying to parallelize my problem so it can run on hundreds of thousands of cores, maybe I should think about trying to make sure that my code runs really, really well and has really good load balance on, say, 1,000 cores. Um, 